everyone, and welcome back to the Whale Nerds podcast. This is episode 142, and my name's Caitlin. I'm back with more um, stories from the Southern Ocean while I'm still on my break before I get back on the ship in a couple days. Well, by the time this episode comes out, I'll already be on the ship, I think. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit more about my time in South Georgia this season. But before I do that, I do want to thank everyone for following along with the podcast. It's been almost five years. Actually, it's been more than five years, I think, at this point. Um, I believe our anniversary was while I was on the ship. So five years of episodes in the making, over 150 episodes between our full-length episodes and our mini-sodes. So thank you so much for following along with us over the years and hearing our stories and listening to the science and enjoying the guests. And it's, yeah, it's just been incredible. Um, especially thank you to those of you that find a way to share the podcast with others, whether it's rating, reviewing, sharing, um, or if you come on trips, or especially those of you that support us on Patreon, um, that's really how we make the podcast happen. Um, and then also a special thank you to the Safina Center for supporting my work on the podcast again for a third year. Um, we really appreciate their support. Actually, their support is probably going to be able to boost us over the next few years um, to be able to support what it takes to run the podcast. So thank you very much for that. Um, running the podcast is not free. So if you would like to be a supporter of the podcast and join us on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash whale nerds. I've put up quite a few posts about um, being down here in the Southern Hemisphere um, including some content that will probably get shared later in episodes, but you get a preview of it first. And some of it is photos and stuff that will only ever be shared on Patreon. So really cool thing to check out there. You can also check out our website, thewhalenerds.com. Um, we have a blog on there. We sell merch on there. And then we do also have social media and YouTube. Um, all of it, basically, you can search whale nerds or the whale nerds. Um, on Instagram and Facebook and on YouTube, we have video versions of all of our episodes from 100 onwards available for you. So basically, I feel like these last couple episodes um, are just like extended trip reports, kind of like the old format we used to do. <clears throat> but there's so much to share that like, I have a huge backlog of articles that I would like to cover as well. There's some been really new and exciting science. Um, but I think it's just going to have to wait until I get home because like, if I don't share the stories from this season now, I'm going to honestly like forget the order of everything. It's already getting kind of blurry because I've been down here for four months. Um, so hopefully you guys don't mind that it's mostly just storytelling um, from down south for now. And I did want to cover my next two trips that I did after what I talked about in episode 141. Um, I stayed on the same ship and actually just worked for Oceanwide um, for two more trips, and they both went to South Georgia. And um, if you listened to the last episode, you know that many of the sites were closing in South Georgia um, as we left on the Cheeseman's trip, and it just continued to get worse and worse while we were gone, um, to the point where there was only a handful of sites open. Um, and so as we looked at, <laughs> as we looked at trying to plan an itinerary for the next trip was South Georgia only. It was like, oh man, like what are we going to do? So luckily what had started to happen is that sites would close. There would be some sort of follow-up to the report and then they would reopen. So it was a constant like shifting uh, situation and it was really tricky to like keep the guests informed as best as possible without like overloading them. Um, because the amount of decisions that the leadership team had to make every day was just like insane between balancing the weather and then also like what sites were available and what activities we could do on those sites. The other thing that made the first trip back to South Georgia a little more tricky compared to others is we had a group on board, like a charter within our regular passengers through Polar Explorers to recreate the Shackleton Crossing of South Georgia. So that also sort of determined our itinerary to some extent because we needed to like drop them off in one place and pick them up on a specific timeline. And like 
parts of like the risk is like, what if you drop them off and then that site closes and then like where they're going closes, like then where do you pick them up? Um, because you plan your route across the top of the island based on like a set destination. And if you have to change that plan on the fly and come down in a different place, like that's really hard to do from up top. So basically, um, I talked about this a little bit on the last episode, but uh, this trip was much more of like an ode to Shackleton uh, themed trip. So when he left most of the crew at Elephant Island after they escaped from the sea ice in the Weddell Sea, him and five other men crossed in one of the modified lifeboats over to South Georgia. And I think it was 16 days. It was one of the most amazing feats pulled off in a small vessel ever in the history of men sailing the ocean, um, just based on the conditions they were in, the resources they had, and what they were trying to do. So the only way they were going to get help from um, Elephant Island, because no one knew they were there and no one was going to look for them there, is to sail to South Georgia. But the weather is so rough and unpredictable and so windy around South Georgia that they were really afraid that if they tried to sail around the backside, that they wouldn't be able to make land or that they would like aim off the north part of the island and then miss entirely. So they landed on the more of the like western facing side, like the northwest ish side, um, at a place called Peggotty Bluff. Well, at really initially at Cape Rosa. So they sailed into this really long bay called King Hawken Bay, and they landed at Cape Rosa, kind of regrouped, and then moved the vessel again um, before they climbed over the mountains. So we also started our journey there so that the ski group could start from Peggotty Bluff in King Hawken Bay and then cross over um, the top of the island and the mountain range. So as we sail into King Hawken Bay, there's a lot of ice, like even more ice than was on the other side when we went earlier in the season. Um, and pretty incredible, huge, tall, tabular icebergs like definitely came off of the ice shelf of Antarctica. And it was a really, really beautiful greeting to South Georgia. So we get into King Hawken Bay. We sail in past Cape Rosa and Cave Cove, which is like this tiny little slot where they... Um, came off the James Caird and rested on the beach for a few days. They got fresh water, which they had run out of days beforehand. Um, and then they also <laughs> ate albatross to fortify themselves because they also hadn't really eaten very much in the last few days. Um, there is an albatross nesting area there, mostly wandering albatross, but a few other species are around. So they ate some albatross chicks that couldn't really get away. And they it sounds like they caught an adult as well. So we sailed by there and just looked at it from the ship. And then we continued into Hawk, King Hawken Bay further um, because what the Shackleton party had realized is as much as Cave Cove looked like it was a protected place, it actually was very subject to wave action. And so after they kind of like regained their strength, they decided that they should not stay there and they shouldn't start the crossing from there. So they sailed the ship across the lifeboat across um, to the other side of King Hawken Bay where there was this little headland so that they could shelter behind and hide underneath the boat. And that's why it's called Peggotty Bluff is because there's like a kid's story where they lived underneath the upside down boat. So Shackleton left three of the men there with the James Caird and him and two others climbed up the glacier and crossed over to Strom Ness. And so they had like nothing by the time they got there. They took like a hammer for an ice axe. They took whatever spare line they had and they took nails or screws out of the boat and just like pounded them through their shoes to make crampons. And in 36 hours, they just like scrambled up, went across and scrambled back down. So pretty incredible feat. Um, our ski group was not going to do it on that much of an ambitious timeline. They planned for three days and they took tents and things with them and they camped and they cooked food and all of that stuff. Um, so we dropped them off at Peggotty Bluff that afternoon when we got there. It was raining and it was cold and windy. And I 
felt kind of bad for them, but like, this is what they wanted to do. So there you go. And then we went over to Peggy Bluff and we did a landing there and we were greeted by elephant seals and fur seals. Um, there's an area there with some king penguins that are usually just there resting and molting. And the elephant seals mostly were weaning pups. They were still, some of the females had pups with them that are fairly young, but mostly they were starting to be weaned and the females and the males were starting to get much, much thinner on the beach. And um, it was so cute to see the elephant seals just like laying around and staring and playing in the puddle that was caused by the flooded area. And um, yeah, really, really adorable. The expedition leader, she's like, Peggy Bluff is like South Georgia in miniature, which is true. It's like, it's got all the things, but like, it's not too overwhelming and it's not too big of a space. So it's kind of like a nice place to start. And then from there, we sailed around to the other side of uh, South Georgia and started the rest of our operations. So like the ski touring group was going to do their thing and we were going to do our thing. And then we were going to pick them up in three days. And there were some people on the ship that were like with the skiers, but like weren't skiing. And so it was kind of interesting that like they got very different versions of the trip. So the next day we went around to a place called Rosita Harbor, which we went on cheese mins and I was like, oh, there's some wildlife here, but there's not much. Wow, was it different when we pulled in there uh, the next morning. There were so many fur seals that we could not land. Like we tried to find a space where we could land, but it's not just like the fur seals on the beach where you're going to put the Zodiac. It's also like how far up the beach, like in inland, can you get? And so we tried a couple places. We tried to like move around and see how the seals responded. And it was just like, absolutely not going to happen. So instead we changed the plan and we did a Zodiac cruise. Um, and we covered actually much more of Rosita Harbor that way. And uh, we found a leopard seal in the kelp forest there, which was kind of a surprise to me. I wasn't really expecting to see a leopard seal that far north in, in South Georgia, but like they cover a huge range, like they go wherever they want. And it was a really big female and she was curious about the boats a few times and came over and investigated us and then kind of was guarding her little spot in the kelp bed. And so it was a really cool experience. And then we still got to see all the seals. We went out and looked at some light mantled albatross that were circling a place that they were going to potentially land. And uh, yeah, it worked out okay. It was interesting to see how it went from like nothing in like 10 days to just packed just like so many fur seals and there were a few pups um so it was like kind of early in the pupping season but there were two brand new pups I think seen by different zodiacs I saw one I think another zodiac saw another one and then in the afternoon uh we went down to uh Salisbury Plain and we did a zodiac cruise there so by the time we got back to South Georgia actually probably before we even finished the Cheesewinds trip uh, Salisbury Plain closed, um, so mostly out of an abundance of caution, but I do think that they had a few skuas or kelp gulls that were, uh, there was a, enough carcasses around that another ship said something and then they closed the site. And since Salisbury Plain is such a huge location for wildlife, just like St. Andrews Bay, um, I don't think it will reopen for the rest of the season. I think once they closed it, that was going to be it. So we Zodiac cruised at Salisbury Plain. Um, it was a quite nice, uh, again, nice zoomed out view, way to see the penguin colony. The penguin colony there, more of it is on the low ground. So you could kind of see some of them spread back up into the hill, but not a whole lot of them. Uh, but there was lots of really good seal viewing as well. And we covered a lot more ground than you possibly could otherwise, really. And we found a cool little cove that you could pull in and basically like put the Zodiac almost on the beach and be like uh, still a nice view, um, an easy setting to like see the fur seals. And it was actually more pleasant, I think, than having to deal with them on the beach because they were much more chill about us just floating right next to them offshore than uh, they are when you're standing on the land. Um, and we got a good look at a white Nelly, a white giant petrel in that cool little cove area. And we got to cruise around and see 
uh, a few females had pups, it looked like, but mostly just the harems starting to form. So you could see the male attracting a few females, and there was still lots of bickering and fighting, and of course, loads of king penguins walking around too. And then the next day, um, so many sites had continued to close while we were there. It was like we were already on plan D by like the third day or the second day, I guess, really. Um, and then as it continued, we just kept having to remake the plan every night. It was like, what was even the point of writing a plan? Because like in the morning, things would change. So that next morning, we thought come hell or high water, we're going to pull off a landing in Fortuna Bay because we really like needed to touch the ground again. Um, and it's a bit, it was a bit tricky because we were supposed to pick up the ski group the next day in Fortuna Bay as well. But we were so worried that Fortuna would close by the next day that if we didn't land the day before and at least get the landing in that all we would do is pick up the skiers in like away from the penguin colony. So we landed at Fortuna Bay. We had like four and a half hours to land there. And it was incredible. The weather was, it was a little windy, a little swelly, but once we got on shore, it was sunny. It was just, it was so beautiful. And the, so you land on the rocky beach. There are fur seals around. Then you kind of like walk along the edge of the cobbled beach and the tussock grass. And like, you kind of have to watch like there's seals coming in and out of the tussock grass and you kind of have to zigzag your way through this maze of seals. And then you get out into this like grassy plain because it's um, king penguins really like uh, landscapes that have been carved by glaciers. So they like a big, long, flat plain um, to have a colony on. And you walk up this uh, gentle grassy slope and you get to the penguin colony and it's like 10,000 breeding pairs. And so it was amazing to be able to stand on the edge of the colony and hear all the chicks and see them running around and see all the parents and just listen to the to the calls and I think it was one of the things that really like saved the trip was landing there and having like hours and hours and hours worth of time there and so that was really really good I really enjoyed that landing um there was lots of cute elephant seals again just laying around being adorable I think they're one of my favorites is like the newly weaned elephant seal pups they're like the cutest thing ever so then in the afternoon, um, we went to Hercules Bay. So we kept going down the coast a little ways. Um, and in Hercules Bay is where there's a macaroni penguin colony. It's not a place that you can land. There's like literally nowhere to land. It's like a bay surrounded by cliffs with one tiny little beach with a waterfall. And so we Zodiac cruised in there and we got to see macaroni penguins, which people were super stoked on. Um, and then on the beach by the waterfall, there was seals and king penguins. There's also a few Gen 2 penguins hanging around and resting. So that was nice to see. And then the next day we picked up the ski <clears throat> group. And so we landed in Fortuna Bay, but actually at a slightly different beach that when you book it on the ship scheduler, it's called Anchorage Bay. Um, and that's where the ski group was going to come down the face of the glacier. Um, I didn't really understand like which side they were going to come down. And I was a little surprised to see where they were when they finally like emerged over the top of the, the mountain and you could see them starting to plan their descent. Um, and it was pretty overcast and a little bit windy and there was a pretty big swell on the beach already in the morning, um, but we pulled it off. We got to see uh, king penguins hanging around resting. There was actually a Gentoo colony there, which no one really had any notes on, but Gentoos are pioneering penguins. They just do whatever they want. <laughs> and so they make new colonies like fairly regularly. And since Anchorage Bay is not like a regular um, landing site, I'm not surprised that there wasn't notes over the last few years of Gentoos moving in there. Um, and then of course there was fur seals and elephant seals and, um, there was, we were able to kind of like make enough space that it wasn't too bad. We had a few juvenile fur seals that would come running across the grass field every once in a while and challenge people, but we were able to manage it pretty well. And, um, 
it wasn't too, too stressful. Um, what was stressful is that the descent down the face of the glacier took about three times as long as we were expecting. Um, the route that they planned down from our perspective at the bottom what looked like probably the hardest way down. Um, but from their perspective at the top, I could understand how maybe they couldn't see any other path. And like, we don't know enough about like what they're doing to help them, like to tell them the right thing to come down a different way. So it took quite a few hours to get them down the face of the glacier and the weather just continued to deteriorate. It just got worse and worse and worse. The swell on the beach got worse. It was raining. It was windy. It was, it was pretty brutal. And by the time we got them back to the ship, like quite a few of them had to go see the doctor because they had been wet and cold for basically the entire three days. And so um, one person was having like signs of hypothermia set in, although they were still pretty like had their wits about them. But like when they pulled up, I was receiving them at the gangway with the doctor. And I just like hit the doctor and was like, you need that one now. Um, but everything ended up okay. A few people had some pretty persistent um, injuries from being cold and wet. And it lasted, unfortunately, for them for the rest of the journey and probably for a couple weeks at home. But they like all came back in one piece. Um, but yeah, it sounded like it was a really tough crossing compared to what they were expecting. Um, there was a lot of standing water on the top of the glaciers and um, they never got dry the whole time they were there. Um, some of the photos they had though were incredible and beautiful, but I will say, I think that when Shackleton did that crossing over a hundred years before it was easier. So yeah, he didn't have all this equipment and all this, you know, mountaineering knowledge. Um, and he wasn't in a big party, didn't have any provisions really with him, but all of the snow fields and glaciers had like a nice pack of snow he crossed in may so it was like early winter um and all of the crevasses in the glaciers like where there's those big cracks in the glaciers probably had snow bridges on them so like there was enough snow that had fallen and like created a covering between the crevasses that he could walk across the glacier without having to think too much about it so now, in the midst of climate change and also the fact that this is summer, those crevasses are open with no snow bridges on them, and then there's standing water on the snow fields. Um, and so it's just way different conditions. And also, the glacier had receded quite a few miles inland, um, whereas he could have crossed basically down to the water's edge probably when he came across before. So, uh, yeah, just different different situation. And it sounded... Like, I don't envy them <laughs> that they did the crossing. Um, and there's a traditional walk, which I think I talked a little bit about on the previous episode because we didn't get to do it on the last trip either because of the poor weather conditions and no visibility at the top of the Stromness walk. Um, and the fact that Stromness was closed, um, we couldn't take them up to like look at Stromness. Um, so they didn't really get to finish their full pilgrimage to Shackleton, unfortunately. However, like the weather's in charge of all of us, right? So the next day we went around to uh, Gripviken. We did our inspection, which we did really well. Um, more of the place, like more of the site was closed. So you actually couldn't walk out to King Edward Point or Hope Point anymore. You could just stay in the area around the museum. And you actually couldn't walk from the museum to the cemetery. Um, the route in between was closed because there were quite a few seals around. Um, and in the station itself, there had been turns that had been really affected. And so there were like infected turn carcasses laying around in there. So they didn't walk, want people walking in between the cemetery and the museum. Um, but we could still take people in the Zodiac. So we still, people got to go toast Shackleton, um, especially the skiers. I think that was a big deal for them. And then um, still got to go to the post office and the museum and the church and all of that as well. So that worked out pretty well. Um, and then in the afternoon, we went to Godhool again. And this time we offered Zodiac cruising and a landing because it is a tough climb up through the tussock. And so um, the expedition leader likes to be able to offer both options. And so I took the Zodiac cruise and we kind of zoomed around the bay and we saw seals and light mantled albatross and then we ended up 
looking at where the Gentus come on shore and march their way up the mountain to um, their colony. And since it was like prime, like about to be laying eggs time of year, um, there were lots and lots of penguins and it was really cool to just sit there and watch them coming and going. There's big groups of penguins swimming all around the Zodiac. At one point I was helping shuttle guests um, at the end as well. And the expedition leader, Allie, she was like trying to defend her area from the fur seals. And she had like one broomstick handle in each hand. And she she was like fighting, fending them off from both sides. And she honestly looked like, like a conductor conducting the orchestra of fur seals. It was pretty hilarious. <laughs> but I mean, it is, you got to do what you got to do. Um, to sort of balance the wildlife and the and the human space you want to use during your landing. So um, then the next day we went to uh, Prince Olaf Harbor and this place called Elephant Cove, which is right next to it. And we did a Zodiac cruise in the morning. Um, I guess you can land at Prince Olaf, like more than 200 meters away from the whaling station, but like, I'm not sure why you would ever want to. Um, and then Elephant Cove, you can't land in there. It's just a Zodiac cruise spot. And um, it was really beautiful. It was glassy and sunny and calm. And so we cruised through um, Elephant Cove, which is just like this little dead end, um, narrow passage. It's like one Zodiac wide with enough deep water to get into this little cove. And there were elephant seals around and there were fur seals around. There was a few with newborn pups, um, which was kind of interesting. Um, again, it was like the pupping was just starting as we progressed on this trip. And so it was really peaceful and beautiful morning. And as we cr cruised around Prince Olaf, it's a it's an old whaling station. It's actually an old Norwegian whaling station. Um, and it's like Norwegian ships were notorious for bringing rats with them on board. And so there were so many rats at Prince Olaf previously that they called it Rat Harbor, um, which is like Rattenhofen or something in Norwegian. And so it's kind of interesting to see like the remnants of that whaling station and um, see how the wildlife's like reclaiming it. Like there's newborn fur seal pups behind with this wreckage of a whaling station behind them, but it was pretty cool. Uh, and then also there's a shipwreck there. Um, it, the vessel's name is the Brutus. The whole situation of how they like used to accomplish things down there in South Georgia is wild. So this ship worked as like a nitrate carrying vessel before it came to its final resting place in South Georgia. And it was like, it didn't operate anymore. Like it couldn't sail under its own power anymore. So ships towed it from South Africa to South Georgia and then they just used it as a coal storage vessel and like left it just offshore of the whaling station just to hold the coal to fire the boilers. Like, why, why is that? I don't understand how or why that's the solution, but it was. And now the Brutus is shipwrecked and it's covered in tussock grass because it's been laying there so long, the grass has started growing on it. And so there's like fur seals like nestled in the tussock grass laying on top of it. Um, and there's gulls with nests on there and stuff. So it's kind of an interesting thing to see and just like a weird, like what a wild story to, <laughs> to how that vessel got there. And then in the afternoon, we tried um, a new landing site that I don't think anyone, including the captain, had ever really been to. But we were so, we were just like running out of options, you know, like we just had to like go for it. So we went to this um, place called Possession Bay. We tried to find a landing site somewhere that worked with the weather. Um, all the spots that were sheltered from the swell had way too much wildlife, which honestly doesn't surprise me. Like they're not stupid. They pick spots that are easy for them as well. Um, so we ended up opting to do um, a Zodiac cruise. I mean, we tried so hard. I think we scouted for like 40 minutes trying to find a place to land and we even divided and conquered like one zodiac landed and tried to like create a path through the tussock and then i went in another zodiac and we went and looked at like three other places trying to figure out like where to go at one point we pulled into one little like cove and the fur seals there like 
some of them looked like northern fur seals which I know like there's absolutely no way that they were but like northern fur seals I feel like as they mature they look like they ran into a wall like their face is like so <laughs> squished and then their nose is like turned up and I just kept looking at like three of these fur seals that were in this one cove. And I was like, what happened to you guys? Like, why do you guys all look like that? Like, you look weird. And I kept pointing out to the assistant expedition leader, like, don't these look weird? These look like northern fur seals. And he was like, listen, man, whatever. Um, but yeah, anyway, so we struck out landing there because there was just way too many seals and like no path. Like there was no, like maybe you get through the thickest part on the beach, but then there's more. So there was just like nowhere to go. So we Zodiac cruised in there. Um, we actually got to go around the back where there was the glaciers coming down. Um, so it it ended up okay. Um, we told everybody like, this is a gamble. We've never been here. Like this is expedition. Let's try it. And um, yeah, it just ended up being a Zodiac cruise. So yeah, we had a lot of Zodiac cruising on our South Georgia only trip, but it's like, what do you, what do you do? Um, and we also didn't go any further south than Godhool. So from Godhool, we started going north again. Um, one, because there was a lot of ice on the south end of South Georgia. So we didn't want to have to go that way to get out and around because um, it would just slow our progress. And two, pretty much everything south of Godhool was closed um, and was also like a huge mortality area. So uh, the ships that came behind us on Cheesemans all of a sudden were in the middle of this mass die off of elephant seals. Um, like they would get to sites and there would be seals dying like in front of them during scouting and there's loads of carcasses floating around and it smelled. And so the reports we had from on our way down, we were like, well, guess we're not going any south further south than like Godhole because we don't want to show people that. And so that was really unfortunate. But it meant that we kind of backtracked and worked our way back up um, the island and then exited from the north side again. And on our way out of Possession Bay, as we were leaving South Georgia, uh, we came across killer whales, which was very interesting because killer whales are not commonly sighted in South Georgia. And there was about 10, and they seemed most likely to be like type A-ish, <laughs> which is like the different types of killer whales in the southern hemisphere it's like a little better defined around the antarctic continent but south georgia is quite a ways north and east of there and so like it is within the realm of like killer whale range but we don't have basically any information to know if they are their own ecotype um, and I tried to look up like information research wise, you know, from different sources, uh, you know, government work and other papers. And like, even in uh, Mark Carradine's book, which is like one of the more recent whale and dolphin guides that's been published, he writes that like type A is probably some sort of like catch all ecotype. And it's probably actually more than one, um, but we just really don't have enough data. And so based on their markings and like their general size i was like they seem like type a's and there were a few of them that had fresh like uneven rake marks that made me believe it maybe came from a fur seal or an elephant seal because especially down towards their back like towards their saddle patch and their tail i was like yeah this could be like a marine mammal hunter they had a lot of scars in their saddle patches which made me kind of think that they hunted marine mammals but yeah, so we got a we got a nice encounter with them. They like to follow this the prop wash and played behind the ship quite a bit. And so that was really, really nice, a good send off um, from Possession Bay. And then as we worked our way up the coast again, there were also loads of humpback whales. And I actually just got the matches back for three of them. Um, and that was back in November. And they're all new to science. So um, there's also not as much coverage of whales in South Georgia. There's just less ships that go there. Um, but also the whales have started to use South Georgia again. So um, this is something we kind of talked about on the California coast as well, that we think there's sort of this like, there was this lot, loss of cultural knowledge in whales during whaling. Um, and so places like South Georgia, the whales were much slower to come back because maybe their ancestors, you know, like, 
were all wiped out that used to use that feeding ground. So it took much longer to rediscover that place. And I, you know, that seems to be the case with South Georgia because it used to be super plentiful. I mean, how else do you end up with all these whaling stations in the 1900s, new construction, if there weren't a lot of whales there? So it was really nice to see quite a few humpbacks on the way. The next morning we did make it to Shag Rocks, but it was so foggy that we had to be like super close to them before we could see them. Um, and we didn't see a whole lot of wildlife because the conditions were so foggy. Um, and unfortunately, the transit from South Georgia back to South America is like just a tough and long way to go. So you're going against the typical weather pattern. You're going against the flow of the um, circumpolar current. And so it's a long transit. It's four sea days to get back from South Georgia. And so that is a really, really tough way to end a trip. Um, but we did uh, we did our best. We put on a lot of lectures. We played uh, trivia. We did all kinds of stuff to try and keep everyone happy and entertained. But it is a long ride back from South Georgia. So that was the South Georgia trip. And then after that, I stayed on Palencias for one more trip with Oceanwide. And that trip was more similar to the Cheeseman's trip where we did Falkland Islands, South Georgia, and Antarctica. Um, it was a little bit shorter than the Cheeseman's trip, um, but it, you know, played out fairly similar. Um, we actually started our trip in the Falklands. We had two days there, which was nice because then we got to explore <clears throat> uh, new places in the Falklands. So the first place we went to was New Island, and we landed in two different places there. On the south end, there's this beach that you can land on near um, a shipwreck in the settlement where, like, people live on the island. And there's a little museum there with specimens and um, information about the ship that was shipwrecked there. And they had like a little pop-up gift shop, was, which was also very nice. And then you walk across like to the, we land on like this narrow part of the island and you just walk across to the other side and there's these huge cliffs and there's a black browed albatross colony, uh, southern rock copper penguin colony and a shag colony like all mixed together and so it was really cool to see all these different birds that live like a very similar lifestyle and nest in like the same place and then in the afternoon we went uh to a north the more northern part of new island and we landed on this really big long shallow sandy beach which came to bite us in the butt later um <laughs> But we uh, landed there and there's a few Magellanic penguins on that side um, and you could see some burrows along um, the slopes of the beach there. And then as we got up to the top, there was a Gentoo penguin colony and they had brand new teeny tiny little chicks. Oh, they were so cute. Like some of them must have hatched like that day. Some of them, the parent was still incubating one egg and one egg was hatched and um we had striated caracara running around the upper part of the island. Um, some guests walked off on a further hike out to the black-browed albatross colony um, to get more albatross views. And then everybody else could walk down past the lower Gen 2 penguin colony and go down to the beach where the penguins were coming on shore. Um, the lower Gen 2 penguin colony actually had one macaroni penguin hiding in it, which was kind of cool to see. It was mostly sleeping with like its head tucked down. Um, but if you're a patient, it did get up and look around every once in a while. And then as we got down to the beach, there was this beautiful white sandy, like kind of tropical looking beach, honestly, because it was like pretty bright light as well. Um, and so it was very interesting to see these penguins just coming to shore on this like white sandy beach. It was like penguins on vacation. It was pretty funny, but like that is where they live. It's just, yeah, it was, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, and in the water, there were also steamer ducks with chicks and there were geese walking around, upland geese with chicks. And so everybody had baby birds around and it was, it was a really nice afternoon. So then the next day, um, initially we had planned for three days in the Falklands just to take one day off the itinerary in South Georgia um, to try and alleviate some of the pressure of uh, having not very many options in South Georgia. Um, but unfortunately, the weather looked so poor that we basically would just waste a day in the Falklands and get weathered out of all of our landings. So 
we decided to just do Stanley for the next day um, as a half day and then just take off for South Georgia because it was like we could either be windy and making progress or we could be windy and sitting around doing nothing. So we decided to just fight with the wind and make progress um, to South Georgia. So we had our half day in Stanley, which like we just let people freely roam around and do whatever they wanted for um, a few hours there was gift shops and they could go down to the museum and the museum entry was covered um, by their boarding passes and so I went down there because I hadn't been down there yet and it was pretty interesting some of it's just like the history of settlement of the Falklands and like what it's like to live there um, and then upstairs there's like a natural history section and there was like all kinds of skulls and specimens and information about the um, Patagonia toothfish fishery which is a lot of how South Georgia makes its money is selling licenses for krill fishing and for um, the toothfish fishery and for the squid fishery. And so there was quite a bit of information about that. And it was really interesting to walk around. And then downstairs, they had what I think is like their space for like a roaming exhibit. Like they change it out every few years. They had like a virtual tour of uh, whaling stations. And so they had this building that was um a uh, maybe the original of something from antarctica but then they had this interaction um interactive screen that you could like do a virtual tour of the whaling stations in south georgia which i i spent quite a bit of time messing around with and looking at i thought it was super cool so that was stanley um then we started to work our way to south georgia i think it was only about one day at sea we did see pilot whales briefly but like so briefly that by the time I ran from the middle of the ship to the back of the ship, they were gone. Um, so that was kind of like a bummer, but whatever, like they're wild animals, they do what they want. And so again, we started our South Georgia approach on like the west is west ish side and landed at Peggotty Bluff. And this time we landed actually on the other side of Peggotty Bluff um a little bit like closer to the exit of King Hawken Bay and there were so many elephant seal pups around most of the adults were gone um they were so cute there were some feisty fur seals a few times like fights broke out and fur was flying and we had to intervene with like getting the guests to safety a little bit um and there were the first harems being set up on the far side of um the bluff and there were brand new first seal pups over there. So that's why we didn't land on the far side um, because there was too many first seals, but we could walk through the tussock and like the flooded area to get over there. At first, when we got there, I was like, it was so flooded because it had been raining that I was like, I don't know if we're going to make it to the other side. Um, but one of the other guides found a path through the tussock that wasn't too miserable um, and not too many seals. And so it worked out okay. And then we had really nice views of the king penguins that were all resting. Um, and then on the far end of the beach, like past where we were letting people walk, there was um, one blonde or golden uh, fur seal, and it was an adult. It was an adult male. So hopefully he had some ladies this year and maybe made some more little blonde fur seals. Who knows? Because um, that was the last time I landed at Peggotty Bluff for the season, but it was definitely a good time. And there's like a waterfall that comes down the beach is like our natural barrier um, for the end of the landing site. And the elephant seal pups were just like laying in the river, practicing, like feeling how it is to like move in the water and like just sticking their face in it and rolling around and practicing swimming. Oh my God, it was so cute. It was so cute. I stood there for a long time um, because it was just adorable. So then the next day, um, we didn't have nearly as much time at uh, in South Georgia as the last trip, obviously, because the last trip was South Georgia only. So then the next day, we covered quite a bit of water, and we went all the way down to uh, Salisbury Plain. And there were more fur seals with pups, including one golden one, one leucistic one. It was kind of hard to see because it was like in the back of the harem, but um, it was cool to see anyway. The morning started out really nice, and then the weather started to kind of fall apart and get windy and choppy by the end. So, you know, it, it is what it is. It worked out pretty well, but yeah, it started to get a little dicey by the end. And then as we were leaving the Bay of Isles and heading to Possession Bay again to try and do a landing there, 
we uh it was like over lunchtime and uh the expedition leader was like hey can we have a few eyes up on the bridge to help with the ice like some of the sailors need to go eat lunch themselves and so if they could just have some extra help up there that would be great and we saw some humpback whales and then I'm like looking at my binoculars and I was like wait a second there's killer whales and I like was really calm about it and I kept looking I was like no there's definitely killer whales and then I like told everybody else I was like there's killer whales up here can I go get my camera like are you guys okay up here and they were like we thought you were joking I was like no there's there's literally killer whales right there and so I ran downstairs and got my camera and they alerted the captain um and then we decided to turn and try and get a look at them which I'm so glad we did um we almost lost them because they were like coming at us and so it was really tricky to like spin around and find them um but we ended up catching back up to them it was a group of like over 15 and they we got really really good looks at them quite a few times and there was birds flying around there was penguins there was fur seals and it seemed like they were feeding like based on their diet pattern and their behavior but like the fur seals and penguins like weren't worried does that make sense like they weren't panicked like when you see transient killer whales in the north pacific and their sea lions around they all just take off like they all just run away and so it was kind of like okay like are they all eating the same thing like are they eating fish and krill like nobody seems too panicked here and um yeah we couldn't really figure out what they were and again we reviewed the photos um, sort of like a type A ish animal, but there were actually matches between the sighting from the 18th on at Possession Bay and this sighting, which was then 12 days later on the 30th. And we were on our way to Possession Bay. So it was like the same area, just a little bit north of where we had seen them last time. So it was pretty exciting to have some matches across a two week period. Um, but it just like confuses me more based on like that sighting of like, what are they and what are they eating? Like, I have no idea. And so uh, in the afternoon, again, we did a little bit more exploration in Possession Bay. We tried to figure out where we could go for a landing. Unfortunately, we couldn't find anywhere to land. So we ended up doing another Zodiac cruise there, which ended also quite windy and choppy, just like the Salisbury Plain cruise did. But um, at least we got out and got to do something off the ship, which was nice. And then... The next day, we had another beautiful landing in Fortuna Bay at Whistle Cove. Amazing looks at the penguin colony, lots of seals around. It was just, it's one of my favorite places, I think, in South Georgia. I mean, of course, I'm, I have a very skewed perspective because like so many places are closed, but um, yeah, pretty incredible spot. And then in the afternoon, Stromness had reopened, and so we did go around the corner and go over to Stromness. Oh, man, that was a stressful landing. There were so many fur seals, so many. I mean, we found a path, like, we found a way through them, and, like, we set up our shore barrels and just told the guests, like, when you land, you have to keep walking all the way to the location where we're going to let you drop off your life jackets because, like, there's so many seals you cannot stop not even to take a photo like you have to keep walking and so we had to escort them like 200 yards up the beach to this location where they could then freely roam and even then like there was still drama with fur seals for the next like 600 yards um, but they figured it out everybody ended up okay um, and they got to walk up towards the waterfall um, Shackleton's waterfall where they like came down the glacier and came uh, to Strom Nest to ask for help. And so that was nice. And I walked up most of the way. I didn't want to walk all the way up to the waterfall, but I walked up the river and there were elephant seals like over a mile inland as we walked up the, up the coast towards the waterfall. I think probably what happened is like when it was more rainy, the river was more full of water. And so they just kept swimming upstream, like, cause it was fun. And then the water receded and they were like, well, dang, now I'm like stuck up here. <laughs> so I don't know how they're going to get back down. I guess maybe when the rain fills up again, they'll just surf back down. But yeah, pretty funny. So then we had our last day in South Georgia. 
and we started in the morning at Grip Ficken. And just like last time, it was the same where like the cemetery was still open, um, but the museum and the museum and the church and the post office were open, but you couldn't walk between the two and King Edward Point was still closed. Um, so pretty much like the last time we had been there. Um, and then in the afternoon, we did a Zodiac cruise in St. Andrew's Bay. Um, the mortality had calm, like kind of calm down as there was less elephant seals on the beach and like the current had swept away a lot of the carcasses. Um, and then the fur seals were starting to come to shore and, and set everything up. Um, it was a nice day at St. Andrews and uh, there was like, as we got down to like the more, of the, I guess it's the south end of the beach, there was definitely quite a few elephant seal carcasses, which was like a bummer to see. Um, but basically when it started to just be like dead elephant seals and no penguins, it was like, okay, we're going to turn around. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, 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 it is what it is. Like it was, it was a pretty good Zodiac cruise and it worked out okay. Um, we had lots of time there and, um, so yeah, it was kind of, it was, a, I think it was a fair good way to end the trip. Um, but really what, was a perfect send off from South Georgia was the amazing sail away from the island. We had the most beautiful sunset. I think the prettiest sunset I've had all season on our way out of there. We had lots of flocks of birds. We had albatross, we had icebergs. It was just, it was so, so beautiful. Um, also just kind of thinking like how all of South Georgia went, like, I swear we went to Prince Olaf Harbor again for a Zodiac cruise and the weather was not as nice as the last time we had been there. Um, but I honestly cannot remember where it fit into the trip. Like, was it the before we went to Hercules? Like, I don't even, I don't even know. This is what I'm saying. Like, everything's running together at this point because I've been down here so long. Um, but I definitely remember going to... Prince Olaf a second time um, because the weather was so bad like parts of the whaling station were like crashing and like it flushed all the elephant seal or it flushed all the fur seals off the beach it scared me I like drove away as soon as it started like stuff started falling down um so yeah I don't really remember where and then also there was some super pregnant fur seals I remember that as well because there were a few like brand new pups that still had like placenta sitting next to them and then there was one female that I tried to stick with, even though it was windy, um, for quite a while, because she was just like rolling around and she was super uncomfortable and she was super pregnant. I was like, oh my God, she's like about to go into labor. Um, she didn't have the pup while we were there, but I do remember trying to approach the beach and kept getting blown off the beach quite a few times. So then as we left South Georgia, we enjoyed our beautiful exit as a small token of consolation for what was awaiting us in the Scotia Sea. Again, for the second time this season, we just got beat up in the Scotia Sea. It was so miserable. Um, we had like a record storm pass through the Southern Ocean. And so like when you looked at the forecast, the low pressure in the middle was like 936 um, millibars, which is like really um astounding number for the middle of a storm it means it's going to be a big one and like the when you looked at the like map and like how big the storm was it went across the entire drake from south america all the way to antarctica and then it was as why it was like all the way the width of the peninsula and all the way to the falklands in south georgia it was just like this massive massive storm so needless to say, we had a very slow transit through the Scotia Sea again, um, and we had all these ideas of where we could go and what we could do, and all of them went out the window again, but we did make it to Elephant Island. It took us three days to make it to Elephant Island, basically, um, which is, again, another slow and brutal crossing, um, and we made it to Point Wild before sunrise, and we um, initially we're going to Zodiac cruise there, but the weather was just way too iffy. And it was like, there's no point in like pushing it just to push it. Like we're going to hurt somebody if we're not careful. And like, we're only partway through the trip. So we ended up just sitting there on anchor, um, and enjoying the scenery for a while before we continued on. 
So it's like a nice little break from the weather for a couple hours um, before we continued the rocking and rolling transit down to the main part of Antarctica. Um, but Point Wild is where most of the Weddell Sea Party from the Trans-Antarctic Expedition from Shackleton's side um, ended up being left while he and five men went to South Georgia. So it was very interesting to see like where the men had been kind of like ditched and waited for months for someone to come rescue them. Um, where they actually like camped underneath the lifeboats, there was a huge avalanche pile there. And I was like, oh man, that's so stressful. <laughs> and um, there's a penguin colony right there. So like they ate penguins uh, to survive and melted snow for water. Um, and I just like standing there, I was just like, I think I would have walked into the water and been like, don't wait for me, guys. Like, that was after already being trapped in the ice for more than a year. And then to sit there in this tiny little corner wedged up against this glacier. Like, dude, that's desolate. Like, you got to hand it to Frank Wilde, who was left in charge there, that he kept all the men happy and that they all lived. Like until they were rescued because like when they took off when Shackleton took off and then James cared like they had no idea if he was coming back like zero like they had to have so much faith that they were going to get rescued to just like survive until then like that's just so gnarly um as we were sitting there we could see the statue that was dedicated to Captain Prado of the Yelcho who came to rescue them after four failed attempts to get to them on Elephant Island um, and then there was also a leopard seal hanging around there, which was pretty cool, kind of guarding a piece of ice and trying to catch penguins that were coming back into shore. So then the next day in the morning, we made it to Antarctic Sound, which is kind of like the north end of the peninsula. And we went for a triple operation day because we lost so much time in the Scotia Sea um, that we were like, we got to just like pack the program in. So in the morning, we did a Zodiac cruise in front of um, Esperanza Base, which is an Argentinian base where people like actually live there. They like send families there from Argentina for, to live there for like 14 months at a time. Um, they have a school for the children there. Like it's a, it's like occupying Antarctica without actually occupying Antarctica. Like it's pretty gnarly. The Argentinians and the Chileans both have bases like that. And actually... Some of the guests like didn't have their phone in airplane mode when they were in the Zodiacs and they got a text saying, welcome to Argentina. Like what a power move. They have a cell tower in Antarctica. Like that's crazy. So anyway, so during our Zodiac cruise, we saw deli penguins. We saw Weddell seals. It was a nice morning, a little bit breezy. Um, there was a whale around the ship on our way back. Unfortunately, we didn't really get in, like get a look at it. We tried, but we didn't, we couldn't really see it. And then we got on board, we had breakfast, and we sailed over to Kinnis Cove on the other side of uh, Antarctic Sound, and we did another Zodiac cruise over there, and we had more Adeli penguins, we had some Gentoo penguins, um, we had penguins on ice, we had penguins on islands, we had Adeli penguins climbing this enormous mountain cliff face, um, which was also pretty incredible to see them climbing all the way up there. And there were a few seals around as well, which was really nice. And then we went over for our final operation of the day to Brown Bluff. Um, and it was so, so sunny. Like we had been getting sunshine all day. I had been putting on sunscreen as much as possible, but I could feel like I was getting sunburned. Um, and so we landed at Brown Bluff. We had, a, it's a place where Adeli penguins and Gentoo penguins both nest in the same place. Um, we had a really nice afternoon there. And we also did the polar plunge there. And after that day, we were so sunburned. Oh my God, we were so sunburned. <laughs> like all of us, like our lips were like all swollen. And I don't know if I've talked about this before in an episode, but there's less ozone over Antarctica. So the atmospheric temperature and conditions are more inclined to lead to a breakdown in ozone over the top of the Antarctic continent than anywhere else in the world because of how the 
concentration in the atmosphere and like the temperature um, and having clouds in a certain layer of the atmosphere, how it all like plays together. And our, the hole in the ozone is basically over Antarctica, but the Southern hemisphere, like as you get south of like 45 degrees, there's just so much more UV exposure. So like all of us, like we looked like we had had lip fillers or something because our, our mouths were so sunburned even after sunscreen and chapstick and wearing a buff and a hat. And it was just like, oh my God, it was brutal. Uh, the next day we were already like out of time. We were already on our last landing of the trip and about to head north into the Drake. So we did Half Moon Island, um, which the snow conditions were quite pink, covered in krill everywhere. It was so gross. There was so much krill in my boots. Um, but the chin straps were lovely. And um, we had a nice afternoon, even though, or nor nice morning, even though it was windy. Um, there was these really interesting cloud formations, lots of lenticular clouds forming um, all around us. And we were like in the little patch in the middle that was like sunny and bright still. And then in the afternoon, we had to go across the bay to Yankee Harbor where a lot of the clouds had been all morning. So I was like, oh boy, I don't know how this is going to go. Um, Cause it was like foggy. Like sometimes you couldn't see Yankee Harbor. Sometimes you could, it looked really windy over there. And so we got over there and there were actually a lot of whales over by the Anchorage, which then made me be like, I don't want to go. I want to sit here on the boat with all the whales. Um, but I went out and photographed as many as I could before we went to the landing um, and it was a really windy and bouncy Zodiac ride so much so that we like changed the landing site to get like as close as possible to the Gen 2 penguin colony. Um, so we could kind of keep it a short landing cause we knew there was a potential that we would just have to cancel it. Like, so we wanted like a fairly tight perimeter. Um, but we actually ended up being able to land for pretty much the whole time that we were expecting. And the whales swam from like by the ship over towards where we were on shore and so I just kind of got to post up and like watch whales and chat with guests about whales um while everybody kind of went back and forth between the penguin colony and where the whales were and there were a few elephant seals around getting ready to molt um there was one Weddell seal by the penguin colony and it is a gen 2 penguin colony over there and then on like halfway through the landing, maybe two thirds of the way through the landing on like the far end of the beach, someone's like, oh, I think I see a seal down there. And it was an, uh, a leopard seal. And I thought it was um, eating penguins. And so we all got to stand there and watch it, you know, eat stuff. It wasn't very close. But then at one point it did swim across in front of us and it came up with something which I thought was a penguin. And then I was like, it's kind of like not acting like a penguin though. Maybe it's just being very efficient. Um, but later we looked through our photos and it was eating a fish. And we actually got good enough looks and photos at it that we could identify the species of fish, which is called like a emerald rock cod. It looks fairly similar to, um, it kind of looks like a ling cod, like if you're from the North Pacific. So um, that was pretty interesting to, to see and be able to identify and be like, wow, this is like eating a fish, which is not something we normally get to see them eat. Like we know it's part of their diet, but like it's not very often observed. And so that was kind of a cool way to end the trip. And then it was two days in the Drake and headed back home. So that was my next two trips in South Georgia. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I really want to see South Georgia on like a quote unquote normal year. Like this season is going to be marked by avian flu. I feel like next season might as well. Um, so I guess it's motivating to just keep taking contracts down here so I can like see more of what South Georgia has to provide. But also it's kind of interesting to think about like the generation of guides that's um, coming up now. So there was quite a big turnover as with most industries of guides that were like kind of close to retiring or like switching careers, COVID like kind of gave them that push, right? So then you have this new generation of guides that's coming back into the game last year and this year. Um, and then now everything's different because of avian influenza. And so like, you know, there's like nothing is normal anymore, right? Like this, things in the world are just happening too quickly. Like normal's not a thing anymore, but um, it is interesting 
like, I don't know, there will be a year where South Georgia, everything's open again. And I'll be like, yeah, I've never been to most of these places on land. I've only ever Zodiac cruised them because of bird flu. But I guess it's motivation to keep coming back. So <laughs> but thank you all for making it this far into the episode. Um, I apologize for all of the background noise between the wind and the rain and people doing laundry in the hallway and the refrigerator everything else. I'm recording from an Airbnb again. Um, but yeah, thank you for sticking with it. Um, thank you for five years of support of the podcast. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to share more stories with you from down here in the Southern Hemisphere for the season. So we'll catch you on the next one. Bye.